I hope you survived yesterday and I hope you are awake for today. We will have a long, long day and we have a long, long night this night. I hope you will all come to our big party and will dance with us. And I promise you it will be fun. Um, it's normal that in, in this morning things a little housekeeping is be done. So first is the party tonight. It starts at 9.30 at 9 o'clock in the, in the Haus der Kunst. And um, another thing is important to me. Um, where is Anne Freire? Anne, can you come please a moment? Here is she. Anne is a friend of mine. Hello. <laughs> Anne is here. Without Anne, we wouldn't be sitting here. Anne is the house. What are you doing? Oh, I'm, good morning from my side also. I'm doing the PR for HVB, the place we are just uh, having this event. And we are very happy that such a great event like DLD is taking place here. So also a very warm welcome from our side here. But this is, this is uh, yeah. but doing the PR is, is, doing the PR is nothing. It's, 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 it's much more. Anne is the soul of Hypovereinsbank. Anne is, without her, we wouldn't do so many things together, so nice, um, exciting things. Um, you know, I'm not a professional, as you can hear, moderator, but I'm, I try my best. I'm a, I'm a Wirtin, I'm a, I'm a house, um, Hausfrau, curious Hausfrau. <laughs> <laughs> and they are not professional moderators. By the way, we are, we, this is organized not by, the, by an agency. It's uh, organized by, by volunteers, by very, very nice young people who, are love the, who love the DLD idea so much that they wanted to work. Sebastian, Nina, but there are a lot of young people here sitting here and they, many have, they did it. And I thanks, thanks for you. And now, maybe you saw coming in this photographer, this, this light, this, you've been photographed. And this is done by a young man who I used to work at Burda. Then he founded a biotech company, and now he's an artist. Jürgen Skriber, what are you doing? Come on. Thanks. Um, yeah, what am I doing? I'm taking loads and loads of pictures. Um, this is a very camera place, so you know that in a world of networked and ubiquitous cameras, a single picture is more or less meaningless. So I take loads of them. Um, you've seen these videos uh, that we started with. Those were animated still pictures. Uh, I shot something like 100,000 pictures of various places. And um, another thing you can do with loads of pictures is creating maps of places or events. So. When you were photographed, and we have this here, um, we took something like 10,000 pictures yesterday, and um, we have 10 people slaving away at the first 500 pictures in Photoshop, and this is the first gigapixel tile that we finished. It's a, if you will, a map of DLD, and uh, I mean it's a networking event, right? So let's see whom we have, for example. Here, who's waving at the camera? So um, that tells you how to behave when you pass that camera. Just smile at it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the more often you pass, the better your chances are to be in this thing. So uh, we passed the gigapixel mark yesterday. Uh, we have something like the first 400 photographs processed, so I hope that by tomorrow afternoon uh, I'll be able to show you something fairly interesting. <laughs> and of course that will be uh, on the net once we figure it out how to upload about 50,000 Zoomify files, <laughs> but <laughs> we'll see how this works out. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, I, I didn't know whether it would work. Uh, thanks for helping me and thanks for letting me do this, Steffi. <laughs> Pleasure. As you heard yesterday, and you will hear today, we are all at the spearhead of a development. Of a, the internet will change everything. 
and a lot of entrepreneurs and um, companies are here, a lot of um, young people who want to found a company, who think about, and some of the thinkers of this development, the philosophers, the sociologists, the psychologists, and some of them who are here, one especially, is a big hero in getting this all together, having a description, having um, a theory, having um, social, so social analysts about what's going on, especially about the people. May I call on stage Don Tapscott, one of the big, big heroes of the internet thinkers. What, are you do what is your passion, Don? What are you doing? Oh, you have this. Okay. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to begin today's session by talking about what I think is a powerful new force to transform every institution in society. And that force, surprisingly, is people. Specifically, a new generation of digital natives who've grown up bathed in bits. And these kids have different brains than we do. And as they come into the workforce, as they come into the marketplace, as they come into society and become citizens, there's no more powerful force for change. Uh, exhibit A, is they just elected their first president of the United States. Could I have my slides on the screen, please? Now, I started studying kids about 15 years ago when I noticed how my own children were effortlessly able to use all the sophisticated technology. And at first, I thought my children are prodigies. Uh, I thought they were geniuses, but then I began to understand that all their friends were like them, so that was a bad theory. So, um, so I wrote a book called Growing Up Digital. It came out 12 years ago. My new book was just released. It's called Grown Up Digital. The eldest of these kids are now 31 this year. And they're coming into every institution, and they're a powerful force for change. They're the largest generation in the world, although in Western Europe, they're not so big. In the United States, this is the baby boom echo, the children of the baby boom, and there are 80 million of them, only 78 million baby boomers. But to me, the defining characteristic of the generation is that this is the first generation to grow up digital. Computers, the internet, interactive technologies are part of the experience of youth. And you know something? Time online for these kids is not taken away from hanging out with your friends, learning the piano, talking to your parents, or doing your homework. Time online is taken away from, correct, television. The baby boomers, their parents, watch 24 hours a week of TV. And these kids watch a lot less TV, and they watch it differently. They come home, and they turn on their computer, and they're in three different windows, and they're talking on the phone and texting, and got an MP3 file going, and three magazines open, and oh yeah, they're doing their homework at the same time. And in the background, the TV's going, but it's like ambient media. It's like Muzak. And when they're online, what are they doing? Well, rather than being the passive recipients of someone else's video for 24 hours a week, like their parents were, they're reading and authenticating and organizing information and composing their thoughts and telling their stories and searching for things, even with video games developing strategies. This is creating a generation whose brains are actually different. Because after your DNA, the most important thing that affects your brain development as a young person is how you spend your time. They have different brains than we do. Furthermore, this is the first time in human history when children are an authority about something really important. Think about that. I was an authority on model trains when I was 11. Today, the 11-year-old at the breakfast table is an authority on this digital revolution that's changing business, commerce, government, learning, entertainment, design, every institution. You know, in the 1960s, we had a generation gap big differences between kids and parents over values and lifestyle. That doesn't exist today. Kids and parents get along pretty well. Look at your iPod and your kid's iPod. There's overlap, 
right? My parents didn't even like the Beatles, you know, let alone the Doors or something like that. What we have today is what I call the generation lap, where kids are lapping their parents on the info track. And if you have a teenager in your house, you know what I'm talking about. Who does the systems administration in your home? So this is a generation that's different. They want freedom. Choice is like oxygen. When I was a kid, I had three media choices. These kids have thousands of choices. They want to customize everything. I never got to customize the Mickey Mouse Club when I was a kid. It's a generation of scrutinizers. When I was a kid, I saw a picture. It was a picture. These kids see a picture. They need to authenticate it. They have great BS detectors because there's so much BS on the Internet. It's a generation with very strong values. It's just not true that young people don't give a damn. Do you know that in the United States, volunteering in high school and university is at an all-time high? And of course, more people, young people voted in this election than ever before in the history of the United States as a raw number and as a percentage. It's a generation that naturally wants to collaborate. I didn't collaborate when I was watching television. They've grown up collaborating. It's a generation that wants to have fun. We asked them, when you're online, what are you doing? And I interviewed 11,000 young people in 10 countries. I said, are you working, learning, collaborating, or having fun? And they all answer the question the same way. They say, yes, I can't answer the question. Those are all the same activity. You know what? The kids have got it right. Work and learning are the same thing in a knowledge economy. And increasingly, we learn through collaboration and hopefully, you're having fun when you're working. I try and make my speeches fun because I find that people learn more when they're conscious. Um, this is a generation that wants speed, they want things to happen fast, and they're a gen generation of innovators. So let me wrap up by telling you a story that made a very important point to me. It was two years ago, and I gave my son Alex, who was 20 years old, uh, a Christmas present. I gave him an advanced copy of a book I had written called Wikinomics. And he took the book and he said, hey, Dad, thanks. And he went off, he started reading the book. He came back a couple hours later and said, hey, Dad, this is a good book. It's like he's surprised or something. But um, he says, I think I'll create a community on Facebook. I said, do you mind if I watch? Two hours later, or sorry, 15 minutes later, he's created the Wikinomics community on Facebook. Another 15 minutes later, he has six members. By the time we're eating turkey on Christmas night, he has 130 members in seven countries, seven regional coordinators for the community. He has a president himself, a secretary, and chief information officer for the community. He sent out a PDF of the first two chapters of the book. Before I'm eating turkey on Christmas night, I've got kids writing back in saying, uh, Mr. Topscott, we found errors in your book. <laughs> and the community is placing demands on me. How exactly will Mr. Topscott be contributing to our community? Like, what is this? <laughs> well, Bob Dylan, there's something going on here and you don't know what it is. Two words, self-organization. Self-organization has been around throughout human history. Language was a function of self-organization. There was no central committee of the English language that said this will be called a pen. It just kind of happened. Science was a function of self-organization. But what used to take place over millennia or centuries can now happen in weeks or days or in a single Christmas day. I never could have created a community of 130 people in seven countries when I was 20, regardless of what I did. There's a powerful new force. And self-organization is changing the way that we orchestrate capability. Social networking is becoming social production. And there are profound changes in the deep structures and architectures of a corporation as a result. So, to set up our panel discussion, I've been working closely with Best Buy over the last number of years. It's an extraordinary company. And the CEO, Brad Anderson, says to me many years ago, you know, I think the most important people in this company are the tens of thousands of young people who work in our stores. 
because they're closest to the customer, they're most like the customer, and in their culture is the new culture of work, is the 21st century Best Buy. And my job as a CEO is not to tell people what to do. My job is to create the conditions whereby human capital is unleashed and where people can self-organize to do things. And that's exactly what he's done. I'd like to bring up uh, uh, Peter Hirschberg, and we're going to hear some stories about Best Buy. Peter is also a consultant at Best Buy, and he and I have been working together, and Peter's going to chair our panel. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> This panel is, is going to be fun today because we're going to look at a company in the midst of transition and try to learn from things, some things about it. And we're here talking about leadership in a time of new realities. And of course, much of what we're talking about in these new realities is against the backdrop of the most challenging economic times any of us can remember. But perhaps the most amazing thing is the combination of what we come to know as social technologies and then the net generation that Don is talking about is bringing about the most profound changes in the art of leadership and the nature of what a company is that we've seen certainly in any of our lifetimes. So to explore this, I'd like to welcome Brad Anderson, who's the vice chairman and the CEO of Best Buy. And Brad is a CEO who's presiding over and pushing much of this change. Brad. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And also, Michelle Azar, whose title is VP Emerging Channels, but more than that, she's one of these people who has been pushing, inspiring, and cajoling change inside of a company where you might not expect such change since what they basically sell is a lot of gear. Michelle. And of course, also in the panel today is Don Tapscott, who has a unique perspective, having written Wikonomics that chronicles maps of collaboration and then the Net Generation book. And, and I want to start with you, uh, Brad. You know, if there was ever a 1.0 style enterprise, it's a place that sells about $40 billion worth of stuff or products through about 1,000 locations with 140,000 people, average age in their 20s. And yet, as Don's pointed out, you've been pushing a significant change uh, in management over the years. And we were in a meeting where one of the kids in that meeting started asking you questions and challenging you. And rather than a top-down CEO, you kind of stopped everything and listened. So my question is, why are you managing like that? And what's the change you've be, been bringing about? How is the nature of a CEO changing? Well, for me personally, that started off with because uh, <clears throat> we're talking about this was a meeting where we had uh, myself yep. and you guys were all there. And we all said, so it was a very intimidating environment. We had this young man who was a supervisor in one of our stores. And he sat and listened, didn't really engage for a while. About two-thirds into the meeting, he sort of stood up and took control of the room. And uh, you could see he was physically shaking when he took control of the room, but he had something he wanted to say. And for me, the first thing is that I was that guy. Um, pro I probably wouldn't have had the courage to stand up. And I actually only got this opportunity because I, I didn't go to school to become a business leader or anything else, I got a chance to learn some stuff in the store, didn't realize it had an economic value, and at one point the founder of our company came out and asked me a question. And I was shaking just like he is when I answered the question, and it eventually got me a chance to lead. And, I, I, and I, what I discovered was that what I actually knew was really important and would work. So I, it was a deep, profound lesson that the knowledge in the base of the business is often at the place where it touches customers, and somebody like me who's a CEO uh, probably is nowhere near where the central <laughs> event that's actually going to drive the company. You know, what's interesting is as we introduce all this collaborative technology in companies, if a company's not programmed to use the stuff, it's just a bunch of top-down people saying, what is all this wiki stuff? But you kind of have programmed the place to want to listen and look at the edge. So when the new stuff shows up, you, you adopt it. Is that how the company's always been, or did you have to n nudge it over there? No, we were, uh, we were as you said, 1.0. We, uh, we were a hardcore 1.0 company. We essentially came up with a strategy that worked with uh, customers uh, throughout the U.S. and expanded that single strategy as fast as we possibly could uh, to kind of get to the place we are. Um, the, one of the great things about our industry, great and awful things yep. about our industry, is that it's in constant tumult, though. And so if you stay at any given place at any given time, uh, you're going to wind up in trouble. In the 90s, uh, one of the books, one of the companies that's in good to great as one of the best companies, and it was one of the top five stocks you could own, was our leading competitor in the U.S., which just went out of business last week. 
So it is, it is a lethal killing field if you stay the same. And, and, and there is so much change, we have to figure out how to adapt to it and how to take advantage of that change and transform ourselves from that 1.0 company to 2.0 company. What's interesting is with so many young people, in many ways, you're the early detection system of what management might look like. We want to get into that, but because not everyone here is familiar with Best Buy, which has been US-based, and also you're, you have a deal with Carphone Warehouse, so you're coming into Europe, uh, let's take a look at a little background video to get a sense for the company and its culture, since this culture is so important to adapting to the new age. Uh, let's take a look at introducing Best Buy. Best Buy, the number one specialty consumer electronics retailer in the world. A family of nine brands and 150,000 people. We're profitable, growth-oriented, and laser-focused on the future. Lasers. Well, actually, it's more like we get out of bed every day and get back to work for customers. That's what we do. Because despite our success, we think we're just beginning to get to know our customers, to understand what's important to them, and where and how we can help. And also because instead of getting easier, we think technology, our first love, is becoming more complicated and frankly, disappointing more and more people every day. I would like it to be a more pleasant experience, just overall. I'm still trying to learn how to use it. It doesn't always do what you want it to do. The minute you invest in it, it changes, and then you have to reinvest. Technology is supposed to make life less stressful and more fun, but it's been our observation and the observation of the customers we talk to in every language that it leads ironically to more stress. Techno stress is horrible. It's a paradox, and we believe it's where we come in. Our mission is clear, to offer customers a perspective they can trust in the midst of techno stress and to make technology live up to its promises. For people everywhere. It's a mission we've earned our way to over 40 years. Founded as stereo specialty retailer Sound of Music in 1966 by a scrappy, hard-nosed optimist named Dick Scholz, our early days were a story of juggling the mortgages, reinvesting capital to grow one store at a time, and weathering the setbacks. The now legendary tornado that obliterated our most profitable store in 1981 was a turning point and a chance to reinvent ourselves and our name. An annual tornado sale evolved into the Best Buy Superstore Big Box concept. A bright, wide open, no hassle, no commission shopping experience that put the customer in charge and put us on the map. Plus, we learned the value of advertising. Any advertising, apparently. Burke Best here for your Best Buy company, Sound of Music, the price smashers. Despite that advertising, we grew fast constantly improving the customer shopping experience. By the mid-90s, we had moved from a regional player to a national one, and generally became the best in the world at the business of selling consumer electronics to a lot of people. And now we're growing around the world. 1,300 stores, 150,000 employees, and $40 billion in revenue. Frankly, we're a little bit amazed ourselves. We're big, but we don't feel big. We sure don't want to act big. In fact, quite the opposite. Can you be big and be meaningful? We think the answer is a resounding yes, if you create an environment where people can buy in, a place where they feel energized, valued, super powerful. And that goes for our customers, too, because there is no us and them. Just one big, all-inclusive us. The idea that the best things we create are the things we create together applies to our relationships with our vendor partners and our international brand partners as well. Geek Squad have raised our standard of service to a level we couldn't even have imagined without them. And Future Shop, Five Star, and Carphone Warehouse have taught us the value of listening and learning and leading with local talent. It's all about figuring out what customers need and then teaming up with exactly the right people to get the work done on the customer's behalf. Looking for other places, uh, other people we can connect with that can allow us to tell stories we can't quite imagine today. That's exciting to me. We have to admit that it's been a long road. But the weird thing is, it feels like we're just getting started. 
We're clear about our mission, and we're smart enough to know that we're not smart enough to pull it off alone. We need help. We need other smart people and great partners who will, along with great customers, become part of this thing called Best Buy. And it'll be fun. You know, in the first part of that video, you concentrate on people's dissatisfaction with consumer electronics. And it seems that somewhere between that insight and the fact that you had all these people working for you who were electronic fanatics, you started moving towards this idea that the real value was in the collective knowledge of your people and your customers and not in the traditional distribution thing. Well, the, the start is that there's a huge challenge because uh, in this sort of ever-moving thing in terms of the use of consumer electronics and the fact that it's ultimately individual. So our choice is all, in, everybody in here is going to have different devices that you hook up to uh, different things that you apply to different things in terms of your life. There's no single solution. So that complexity, we've got to figure out how to solve. And the only way we're going to be able to solve that complexity is draw on a lot of capability that we certainly don't have within the context of our own boundaries. So that took a that's going to take a particular kind of culture and a particular kind of energy to solve. So you created a strategy which you call customer centricity that said yeah. we need to get close to people. This is where Michelle enters the picture. You were in traditional merchandising and you looked at this and realized we can't get close to our customers store by store, ad by ad in a 1.0 way. And so you somehow connected that with Web 2 and scalability. So my question is, what was it like when you introduced this basically orthogonal concept to the world of merchandising? So what did you bring in and how did you react? Yeah, how did the orthogonal thing go? <laughs> <laughs> well, I saw uh, an increasingly um, real way to accelerate customer centricity. It was so real to me and no one was talking about it. We were talking about the same channels, the same way of engaging customers. And in 2003, Brad set forth on this customer-centric strategic imperative, and he said it would take 10 years. Well, about halfway through, I saw an opportunity to open up, uh, leverage the collective intelligence of the world, not just the folks at Best Buy, and to open up in the way we collaborate. And so by doing that, um, we're going to be able to scale much more quickly in an open, agile, efficient way and we serve our customers in the new places that they're spending time where Best Buy didn't have a presence. So, th But this is a new language, right? You're talking the language of Web 2.0 to a bunch of merchants. So what happens when she shows up and says, hey, there's this massively scalable way we can include customers, there's APIs, you know, the world's different today. Everybody gets angry at her. <laughs> so I mean, the essential first reaction is, what the hell is she talking about? Doesn't come from IT department, comes from a person who was a merchant, and, and has her own curiosity in her journey. And the, that's actually, for me, what's exciting is you'd never know where the insight that's going to drive your enterprise comes from. And the question is, can you figure out how to solve that gap between the frustration of that insight and actually being able to use it? And there was an essential thing about change management here, because when we started working together, half the task was, how do you build a story where people who are, they're very smart, but they're very busy, and they don't understand that getting a community of customers involved, creating a developer community, that all of this is a way to grow. It just looks like another busy thing. So to comment on that, Peter, it, it really made it, made it more tangible when we were able to bring people along on the journey, connect with all of the zealots throughout the organization and show the stories of what people were actually doing with the technology. Less so about the technology, more about the benefit and the promise that it delivered. And when we rolled up the story, Peter and I worked together with all the zealots across Best Buy, and we rolled up the groundswell of opportunities that were happening, listening to markets, co-creating, and suddenly realized that that was the way to break through and invite yeah. everyone along. And it harnessed what's precious about Best Buy, our culture, our people, our tech-savvy individuals who work at Best Buy day in and day out. Don, it seems that a lot of times when companies try new things, they have like this near-death moment. In Wikonomics, there's both P&G and Gold Corp, and they do something new, not through planning, but because they kind of have no other choice. Well, yeah, in the case of Procter & Gamble, uh, they'd lost half of their market cap, they were in deep trouble, and their new CEO, A.G. Laffley, said, we need to open up this company and to get innovation to come from outside. I mean, you do the math. They're trying to find a molecule that'll take red wine off a shirt. They have 9,000 chemists inside their boundaries, and a million outside that they can now get to. These chemists are organized on the web into what I call idea agoras. And sure enough, there's a retired chemist in Munich, 
or a grad student in Taipei comes up with a molecule, PNG pays them half a million dollars, and they have a fabulous new product. They now have 23 brands that are over a billion dollars. So in the case of Gold Corp, it was a, a, a similar thing. Here's a company where this guy, he's actually my neighbor, which is how I, I know the story. He takes over a gold mine, and his geologist can't tell him where the gold is. After a few years, he's ready to shut the thing down. But then he has a revelation one day. He wonders, if my geologists don't know where the gold is, maybe somebody else does. So he does a radical thing. He publishes his geological data, opens up the company, and he holds a contest called the Gold Corp Challenge. Half a million dollars for anybody who can tell me, uh, do I have any gold? And if so, where is it? Uh, he gets <laughs> submissions from all around the world. They use techniques that he's never heard of. And for his half a million dollars in prize money, he finds $3.4 billion worth of gold. And his market value goes from $90 million to $10 billion. And I can tell you, because he's my neighbor, he's a happy camper. You know, both of these so. stories have happy endings. But on the way to it, there must be hero engineers at P&G that are pissed because their job is no longer invented yourself. And, and, and these poor geologists must have been insulted. So how do they bring that change about? That's a big change. Well, it's all about the same kind of thing that's going on at Best Buy. You need to change the culture and the reward system. Like at Procter & Gamble, these 9,000 chemists originally had the, it's called the NIH syndrome, right? Not invented here. But now they change the reward system so that you get compensated based on innovation, not whether or not you did it. And now at P&G, they call it the PFE syndrome, means proudly found elsewhere. I want to, uh, to make this concrete, Michelle, about well, four or five months ago, we put together a video that captured a lot of the work you guys are up to. It's a clip that we call Company as Wiki. And take a look at it because it shows technique after technique that, that you have either been experimenting with or applying that you might not normally expend, expect in a large organization. Let's take a look at that and then let's talk about some of those things. Can we have Company as Wiki, please? We had to take communication to a web 2.0 environment. We had to take it online. I think the tools are incredible. You get better loyalty. You get less office politics. Taking an idea and really stretching it across the entire organization and network out, meet individuals that are passionate around the same thing to accomplish something that you'd never be able to accomplish on your own. Most companies traditionally communicate at employees. They send a message to employees and the message gets received, you hope, and now we're done. But that's not how the world works anymore. Employees will start groups on Facebook or MSN or MySpace or wherever. They're already socializing. Why not give them a venue where you can be part of the conversation? A group of us set out to say, well, let's make a difference and let's change this. Blue Shirt Nation is a social networking website, something very similar to MySpace. Blue Shirt Nation has been pretty much like a lab for us. It's allowed us to try a lot of different things, fail really fast, and then try things again. It gives me an opportunity to really connect with more of my coworkers, not just here at the store, but throughout the entire company. The water cooler is the online discussion forum that allows employees to talk about whatever's on their mind. It's the only method where I can actually talk to my team from the comfort of my own home. It's the fastest way to distribute information across the entire store. The use of Wiki makes our employees feel like they're empowered and that they can contribute to everything within the company. If the stores are learning something from the customers or any experiences, any events that they're having, they can add in the Wiki page. I have created the actual home theater page. It supplies the retail field information on home theater. We also have contact lists on there if they have any questions. One of my employees had a great idea, and he came to me and said, what do I do with this idea? The idea itself was the Geek Squad gaming services. I told him to go ahead and post on the Loop Marketplace. The Loop Marketplace is where people can go to post innovation ideas that they want some feedback on. Four hours later, my idea was up, and people were commenting on it. I was funded. Now it's going company-wide. It's a pretty fun process, actually. With so many stores spread so far and wide apart. How do you actually get people's voices 
into our most important decisions. How can companies use the power of the free market to help drive their decision making? Tools like the prediction market tool help us do that. It's a web-enabled stock market game. Stocks represent future events or future outcomes. And people trade in the market based on what they think will happen in the future. If I'm leading a project and the stock is, will this thing launch on time? And then all of a sudden it went down 20%. I instantly know that something has happened. That gives me a chance to be able to have a voice to leadership when they're seeing the stock, when they're seeing the movement and the changes going. And know that the stuff that I know is valuable enough that people want to hear it. When we talk about our core philosophies at Best Buy, it allows us to bring our unique experiences and ideas to the table. You know, it's not easy to call up Brian Anderson and say, hey, look, this is what I'm thinking. You get better loyalty, you get less office politics, and you create the conditions whereby this marketplace of ideas can come to fruition. We're talking more as a company at all levels, which is great. I think we have to turn that transparency outward towards the customer and allow them to participate in the conversations as well. Imagine a Wikipedia not only populated by the masses looking for knowledge, but also by a bunch of tech masters from Geek Squad who are also using the same space for their own use. Now you've got the quality of the crowd and some Zen masters in the mix. We're moving from a role of being the ones who own the messages and deliver those to employees to a role that we are just facilitators. We're encouraging, we're enabling. We're getting ahead of the curve so that when those next generations of folks come work for us, we're set up. We already have everything ready to go for them. It allows us to use those insights, and that input, and that feedback to do better at serving our customers. You know, Brent, in that video, it's clear you're moving to this various network organization stuff. There's managers saying our job is to listen. There's employees contributing, doing things. This must challenge traditional notions of, of management, and particularly middle management, that was kind of invented as a mechanism to be a communications function. Yeah, it's a phenomenal check and balance on middle management. As you can, uh, I'll give you a specific example. Uh, we were going to open a store in China, and they, we created a marketplace of market. Basically, people can buy in, and and they and, and they can buy various dates that they think the store will actually open. Well, the executives came in and said the store is going to open on this date, and as we went into the plan, the market started moving the date out in terms of opening uh, actually about a month and a half later than the executive said. We opened it when the market said, not when the executive <laughs> said. So you get a, you get a chance for uh, insight that you wouldn't get. Uh, it, also puts, it also puts people into it, uh, for those of us in executives, it puts us in a very different kind of role. I mean, one would assume when a recession ends and the smoke clears, the balance of the number of middle managers, the number of line employees, all of this will look a little bit rejiggered because you don't need to do things the way you used to do things. Yeah, but I'm not sure how it'll land because the, the role of now, you really need people in there who have curiosity trying to spur the work along and enthusiasm. You won't get the, you, you, you need leadership more than ever. But the style of that leadership is really different because that leadership has to be inviting in, curious, looking for somebody else's insight, not, not handing you the insight they want you to implement. Michelle, there are a couple of examples that came out of this that I love. One was, uh, there was a 401k program. This is a U.S. program where you try to get employees to pay into a pension system. And because the average age was 23, there wasn't much interest. HR kind of gave up on the function, threw it to the employees, and then what happened? Well, it was, it was a, a classic problem. We didn't have adoption from the, from the employees on participating in this program. And so they threw it to our social network called Blue Shirt Nation at the time and challenged the community to appeal to this audience in a way that um, would, would um, generate interest and participation. So we waged a video contest. Uh, the guys on Blue Shirt Nation had talked to the field, arranged a contest, and the top winning video that explained the program to retail employees in their words, um, the top winners of that, that program were invited to corporate presented to the board of directors, the winning video, actually, Brad, it's a story about the winning video being pre presented in the boardroom. And those employees um, were so energized about the program that the participation rate went from 18% to 47%. Phenomenal. And stay put, because you let the employees do the selling on, on it and stay put there. There's another exactly. case where... There was a place that didn't work, though. 
Huh? It didn't work in the boardroom. Right. Oh, oh, that's the other point. Right. When, yeah, when, but, when uh, the employee led, so this is a bunch of 23 year olds make a video for a bunch of 23 year olds about why you should sign up. You show it to your board of directors. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> right. And they're like, what, what is this? Yes. Meanwhile, participation doubles right. because the employees do more about managing themselves and yeah. HR. Right. Yeah. Another case was uh, the, uh, on the floor at Best Buy, there's an IT system that the guys use. There were two of them. The employees didn't really like it. And you wanted to. They put it out to bid to a big consulting firm, and rather than the consulting firm at eight million bucks, you use Blue Shirt Nation to suggest that the employees go build their own IT system. What happened? Well, there was a network of developers actually who um, rallied together and decided to build a prototype on their own. Um, net net, it, it turned out we have this amazing talent of developers within our our stores. And when you say developers, these are people. They didn't get hired as developers. They got hired to sell. DVDs or be Geek Squad people, and what you learn through the social network is they knew how to code. Exactly. And they self-organized. And so around this, the net net was we had a, a portal that actually appealed, was designed by employees, rolled out. There weren't any scalability issues, and it was built with a fraction of the price. So it was like two hundred fifty thousand dollars to roll out, and it was a, an amazing learning because now we have developers as employees pointed at a business problem that we couldn't have solved without them at that cost. Well, one of the things that happens when you suddenly give these tools to employees is you lose control. Well, what was the case of you had an employee discount program and the social network kind of came in and slapped the board? Well, so this is an interesting example. So um, Brad talked about getting input that you wouldn't normally have or hear voices that you wouldn't necessarily hear in your big management meetings at corporate. So there was a cost savings exercise that went on that cut the, um, made changes and cut down the employee discount. And suddenly this, this um, overwhelming response came out of our social networks where they didn't want to change the employee discount. It was a training program. That's why they worked at Best Buy. So there were all these benefits that we didn't even take into account until we heard this groundswell of voices through the networks that we were created. Brad, as you start to code for less control from the top, more take responsibility, this must create, okay, the good news is less bureaucracy, the bad news is there's got to be less stability, kind of like anything might happen. Well, there's, uh, yeah, but it's a stability that I've always th thought is malignant. Uh, they, you know, if you really look at what the value added uh, by people doing the same thing over and over again, especially with what we pay people to do is sort of orchestrate that, usually it's pretty thin. Uh, so what you what you get is uh, you you if where we're at our best with and this is we're describing what we're in the journey of trying to create. We don't want to no. create the impetus that we're there yet by any stretch of the imagination. But what you can probably imagine from this is this is a much more interesting place to work than it would be if we hadn't started on the journey. It also forces to ha has to get absolutely clear about what we're trying to do, because in order to inspire people to engage, they've got to know what the story is you're trying to tell. And it changes the role of leadership in terms of getting really clear about what you're trying to achieve, not so much how you do it, but what you're really trying to get done. You know, all of this is great strategy. One place where a big company puts its money where its mouth is, is the commercials it runs at Christmas. So this year's Christmas commercials were not about price or availability or come on down. It, they were actually about how clever your people were at understanding customers. You, you weren't selling price availability or all that other stuff. You were selling that moment of customer interaction. I, I want to show a couple of these commercials because it's the first time I've seen a big box store do a commercial not about the big box stuff, but about, about customers and relationship and people. And then let's talk about what's happened after that. Can we take a look at some of these commercials? Right before Christmas, I did a consultation for a guy who was legally blind. He's been living in the house so long, he knows the house in and out. So he kind of memorized the walls when he wanted the TV. He also had a three-year-old son who ran around the house who liked to play hide and go seek. Finding him sometimes is really hard because he's really short and he's quick. When we were done, we had to teach him how to use uh, okay, good. four different remotes to touch. We had to good. count the doing? buttons from the bottom. Good. Got it done for him. He was really happy though. He couldn't I'm, stop okay, thinking. So I do questions His name was Charles at actually. About Charles Edward Shipman. Right around Christmas. there. Yeah. Morning of the big game. Morning yeah. of. Guy comes in. He's like, hey, I want this TV and I want it installed today for the big game. Lucky for this guy, my install had canceled. It was like all the stars aligned. Walk into the house. His wife, it was so funny. And she's like, 
Everything is ready. Nachos, drinks, and little weenies. We walk into this living room, and right between the two speakers, there's no TV. A hole. You know, it's a hole. 35 to 40 people trying to hook up wires, and I'm hitting somebody's hip. I got done, and all the guys were like, yeah! I'm walking out, getting a high five. <laughs> I just love my job. Couple came to the store, newlyweds, looking to get set up with the new computer. Kind of butting heads a little bit when they first came in. It wasn't a full-up bro, but the husband really, 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 really wanted a PC, and his wife really, really wanted a Mac. She was actually a graphic designer, and then he's like, but I have to use PC, I need to be able to open up Excel. I was like, well, did you know that the Mac computer can work with your Excel? Let me show you guys. And she's like, yes. She was literally, like, dancing over. She danced in a fit of joy. She looks right over to her husband. The husband has, like, a full-on smile. He's just like, this is the one. This is it. I kind of did bring two people together. It feels nice. <laughs> Don, had you seen those before? So I want your reaction, having written the book about the net generation, and now looking at commercials that are basically showing net generation behavior as a corporate asset. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, to me, it's reflective of the big change that's underway at Best Buy. As an outsider, I would describe it this way. Best Buy used to be a company that would sell consumer electronics through stores to customers. Now it's a company that is in the business of building deep, relationships, creating complete experiences with customers to deliver all kinds of new value. And this is powered by human capital being unleashed in the company as it's permitted to self-organize, and it's also being powered by a new generation of young people who just think differently. Um, the, the other thing I, I love about this is it kind of codes in the commercial to the employees, your job is not to do an official sanction thing, it's to go meet people's needs. And it, so this, this, this ad is as much about selling the channel of all these cool people as it is talking about the corporation. Did you, do you get any flack from this? Like suddenly employees are so empowered, they tell their management, no, I've got to do this thing for my customer, I'm not going to follow the procedure? Yeah, yeah, you do. I mean, it's, uh, for me, this, this, the, there's a certain sort of naturalness, to, if we can get this right, which is a, essentially, I believe that most of what you've got in organizations, how much energy does it have? Yeah. This stuff builds energy. If people have a chance to have self-accountability and can do something that they help create and love, they've got more energy. What a customer will get when you get in a store is you can tell whether that store has got energy and engaged employees serving you or not. And it, so it's, it's the, the tools are phenomenal in terms of what they potentially enable in terms of culture, but it also means you can't control it like you could. And your sense of control has to change. Okay, now in our story, we're really about to give up control, because what we've talked about so far is kind of this internal stuff, but the part that you've been working on now is essentially opening up Best Buy so that developers, customers, employees, an entire ecosystem can start extending the enterprise as a growth strategy. And and, and this is really your plan to double the size of the company, isn't it? Yeah, because we, we believe this as, uh, and we'll find out. Yeah. But our hypothesis is that, that this is globally relevant. So we'll look at a video in a moment, but tee up for me what you're focusing on now with the program you call Remix and how you're basically betting on that a whole open community of people who are part of an ecosystem are part of the growth equation. So as I, as I mentioned earlier, I saw an opportunity to connect with customers in places where Best Buy wasn't present. So the whole concept of Remix, it's an open API. It's a way of taking down the walls around our data and opening up all that we know so that the world can innovate on our behalf. And what I mean by that, I'll tell a, a simple example. Um, last Christmas, uh, a developer developed an application called a Wii Finder that pinged our website. We should tell people this is for the very popular Wii video game. Right. For the Wii video game. Very useful application. We blocked it. And when we blocked that, developers still developed against the website, but we didn't have an open API to release accurate information. So it, what returned on that WeFinder was 7601 Penn Avenue, which is our corporate headquarters. And I'm pretty sure you won't be buying a Wii at our corporate headquarters. But the beauty of opening up our data through an API uh, with our partners, Mashery, we're able to share that information. So now we have inventory, location, price available, and we have the world who can develop on our behalf. You know, what, what, what's interesting about this is you take something that sounds geeky. We have an API, which is a code thing. Normally, when a CEO hears API, it's like, great, go talk to the IT guy. But this is core to how you're, 
How you doubling the company? Uh, and and, and Mashery is in the audience here, another of their customers, Guardian, is here. More companies realize, especially during a recession, the way you grow your company isn't more people and fixed extents, it's letting an ecosystem do it for you. So let's look at this final video, which is Best Buy's open social strategy, which is really about how do we get an ecosystem out there to help us double the company without our throwing all this hard investment at it. And let's take a look at that and talk about what we're doing now. Let's take a look at the final video, please. What made us great in the old world could be our inertia in the new. We're going to try a lot more small ideas. Being out there, being relevant, being where, where people are. When you let Pretty everyone good. in to, to help solve problems, you have a lot more chances of hitting your target. Recognizing that into your business model becomes very, very critical. We do a lot of business on BestBuy.com, but there are ways to actually extend the brand beyond one big website. And Remix is fundamentally about putting the store where the people are, instead of saying to the people, come to our store. We have a global platform now for remixing Best Buy. So we've taken down the walls around our data, we've opened it up to the world. And that means that developers, customers, business partners, and employees can help participate in how to tailor an experience that's going to be unique for the customer. And in that kind of world, the best way to work is to make sure that you cast your net wide to test as many assumptions as possible. $5,000, you can innovate a concept, or for free, innovate a concept and prove it out before you invest. This allows us to have thousands of experience launched simultaneously and allow the customers to choose one that best fit the way they like to interact with our brand. Best Buy had to rewire a bit to show up in those spaces. The first really big one is Supportopedia, which is a website that uh, offers free support and service online and then ties that back into Best Buy for people to purchase the things that they may need. The idea started as an internal knowledge sharing tool, then we just decided, why lock it up? Open it up to customers. So what you have is one area where our experts can store their knowledge and the customers can have access to it too, and they kind of feed off of each other. Myself and another developer in seven days, we created m.bestbuy.com, which is an interface you can actually access through a mobile phone and see our stock, see our customer reviews and ratings, and search for products. Gift tag is a, is a universal gift registry. You add some functionality to your browser, go to any website, find something that you want, click the button, grab the thing, add it to a list, and share it with your friends and family. Another one is a, is a simple search function that you can embed into iGoogle. So if you're looking for an item, you can actually do an embedded search that isn't on BestBuy.com. You can search BestBuy.com without being there, which is kind of neat. If there's a particular album you're waiting for or a game you're looking forward to the release on, you put a widget into your iGoogle that lets you count down the days, hours, minutes, and seconds until that item releases. Spy is something I created um, from home, kind of in my nights. What Spy does is it, it aggregates a bunch of social media and it kind of puts it to a scroll on a screen. Spy came from what I saw was a need to explain to people kind of the social media thing going on in the internet, how conversations are happening about brands, about people, after. about things. We can go to quarter after. A so lot of it is about brand so engagement go to questions and brand metrics after. that are, have yet to be created. So my team and I manage and moderate um, our community forum, um, our company's blogs, and our company's Twitters. We want to be a connected retailer, which we are becoming more and more every day. So engaging with customers on their personal blogs and forums, showing them that we're here to assist them before, during, and after a purchase. Some people uh, in the marketing department actually um, set me up on uh, something called Twitter. And then they actually set up a blog for me too called BarryJudge.com. I started just talking about what was going on at Best Buy. I put our advertising uh, out there at, before it's done. So people get a chance to see it in its raw form. They get some idea as to what, why we're doing the advertising we're doing. The crowds have input. The crowds are not making the calls on what we should or shouldn't do. And I think that that's the important thing is, is to get as much input as you possibly can get and then make a decision. Having a single channel doesn't work. You have to open it up and, and, uh, and actually be where customers are. That translates to growth in my mind. We're showing up, we're present in areas that we weren't before. So I think what social technology does, it provides a platform for us to share uh, more of what we know. So I would say the role of leader is patience, empowerment, 
and know enough to trust and empower your employees. All of the possible experiences, all the possible ideas, all the possible solutions that are out there far, far greater than we could ever come up with internally. And when we take the set of information that we have and we let the other people uh, in the world use it in ways that, that they can imagine that we can't imagine, our chances of coming up with something that's truly cool go way up. You know, Brad, there's a real leadership thing going on here, which is uh, you need your senior leadership to think very differently. Digital isn't a channel, it's a way of looking at the world. Barry Judge, your marketing guy there, a year ago, kind of didn't know what social media was, and now he puts rushes of commercials up on his blog, and he lives that way. Talk to me about bringing the management team along like well, this. Well, think about this for in relationship to, uh, for us, our strategy that got us, you mentioned the 1.0 at the beginning of this. The thing that got us the 1.0 is we took a strategy to differentiate the way we came to market. And we spent about a year sitting in focus groups with elements of the strategy, trying to listen through a glass wall to find out whether or not it was going to work. Um, he can sit there and, and go and engage immediately with a huge marketplace that gives him feedback many, many times richer, directly engage with it. But that was a radical shift from anything he'd learned in terms of learning to be a marketing. Uh, it, it was a, and it's a huge change in terms of lifestyle pattern. And he had to give up a lot to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. What we've seen is, I think, to be honest with you, most of our executives have not willing, been willing to do it. And we've had to go through sort of a, a generation of, of finding the leaders that will do what Barry's done, which is to take it as an adventure, learn how to do something new, uh, and, and really, really fully dive into the water. You know, Michelle, one of the things when you when you treat this as a developer program is you never quite know what will stick to the wall. You're opening it up and seeing where the energy is. So what have you learned and what have people started doing since you opened things up to whoever might show up? So I'll just say two, share two examples. Um, first of all, we're on, on the beginning of this journey. So in the last two days, we're actually seeing developers create stuff that we never dreamed possible. So we're seeing applications around Wii shopping and social shopping being built. So putting Best Buy into this social shopping experience, you can, you can look at what your friends are looking at, um, what they're purchasing, and the comments about certain products online. So that's an example. The other example is within the enterprise, by sharing all of this data, we're finding employees, for example, using it to improve internal um, experiences. So one example is out of Store 515 in, in um, Florida, we have Ryan who emails and says, Remix, meaning all of this data we've just opened up, has provided a level of interactivity never dreamed possible for my home theater geek squad selling program that I'm putting together. This is at a very local level. By opening up our data, we're allowing our sales associates to create better tools in the selling process. Those two things are, from an outside of the world, an internal example, um, give us a business innovation pipeline never dreamed possible. You know, it's interesting, if there's a B2B and a B2C playbook, you're bringing the developer playbook in now. Let me wrap up with a question for you, Brad. As I was preparing for this, I was talking to some of your European uh, yep. uh, development folks. And, and their view is they want to leapfrog what, what you did in the U.S. and actually start building out a whole services business, getting closer to the customer. You know, how do you mix telecom and distribution of, of content and go beyond the CE experience? Uh, give, me a, give me a sense for what you see coming next and, and, and what we might expect to see here in Europe. Well, we still haven't solved 90% of the problems we've identified. And uh, part of the premise is that uh, there's, if you look at the world, there's virtually nothing you can't solve. The, the thing the team, ha team in Europe has is they've got an utterly clean slate. So they don't have some of the baggage we've got. And they're hoping to basically use the clean slate uh, to be able to move at a much higher velocity than we've been able to move uh, in North America and in China at this stage. Don, I'm going to give you the final comment. When you wrote Wikonomics, you pointed out that the very nature of the firm really was built at a time when you couldn't have all this collaboration easily, rapidly among firms. Uh, t tell us that story, because I think that frames this economically for us well, at a time of change. Well, to, to me, the Best Buy story points to some big changes in the nature of the corporation and also in the nature of leadership. That throughout the 20th century, we created wealth through vertically integrated corporations where talent was inside our boundaries. Now, companies can open up because the internet 
is not about websites or eyeballs or stickiness or clicks or any. Don't use the term websites. It's a, such a dot com idea, okay? The internet is a global platform that drops collaboration costs. So Best Buy can engage its customers in producing things. Consumers become producers. Best Buy can open up its APIs and reach out to the rest of the world and create a platform to co-innovate with the world. And similarly, you have a CEO who says, and who behaves very differently than a lot of other CEOs. The traditional model is, I'm the CEO, I'm in charge, I make decisions, I sell a vision down. Whereas the new CEO that's emerging, again, you can see this in the culture of youth, is one who says, no, I create the conditions whereby the human capital inside and outside this organization can be unleashed and can be brought to bear to create value for our consumers. You know, this is a conference where we've been talking about new realities, and what's exciting is I think this begins to point to how one manages an enterprise with less cost and more velocity and may give us a sense for, as we come out of this recession, what effective organizations look like. It's a message of hope. So I want to thank you all very much for sharing stuff. We have just a few minutes for questions, if we have any questions in the audience. Go ahead. I'm going to give you the microphone just yes, so people good. can hear you. I'm dealing with uh, Enterprise 2 and I know the most troubled uh, question is uh, what the return of investment, what's the ROI? And but it's uh, uh, amazing example what you're showing here. And uh, I just wanted to ask you how you measure it and do you see a return on investment or what's the value of investment? Great, great question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, what we're seeing, it's, uh, and it's one of the challenges we have uh, right now is uh, one of the things we saw earlier in, the, in, in this past, in the, we're just ending a fiscal year, is we were able to do things that are very hard for retailers to do, like our stores over eight years had started to comp negatively, which a lot of retailers I know has tried. We had been able to shift the comp store results out of those from negative to positive for the first time in our history. What's happened to us since the economy in mid-September collapsed is those stores, like the rest of the system, has gone negative. But we found that we've been able to have much higher, we're, we're gaining market share at a faster rate than we ever have historically. We're picking up, uh, uh, we have higher customer satisfaction scores. So we've had, uh, we think we, we could get very tangible results that, that support the Brad, thanks very outcomes. much. We need to move on. Thank you very much. There's much more today. Thank you so much.